Boy, if there's one thing I don't like feeling, it's feeling nervous about having to read scripture or recite it. But uh, hey, I can do it, and I know you can too. And so I hope that is an encouragement as well. But if there's another th feeling that I don't like, it's the feeling of being guilty of any wrongdoing. Um, some of my errors, of course, are in ignorance, but others are not. And in general, I like to conform to cultural norms. I want to abide by the laws of the state, and especially I want to be in obedience to the Lord's commandments. So if I do something wrong, if I am truly worthy of blame, I have a tendency to try to defend myself or try to excuse what I've done or to seek some way out of my guilt. It may be something as minor as maybe a parking ticket. You know how annoying those can be. Uh, and how you wish you didn't have one. Or it could be like a speeding ticket, not that I've had many at all, but sometimes it's I'm guilty of forgetting a very important appointment. And I hate that feeling of guilt, that I know I'm wrong, and I am blameworthy in that. Now I want to ask you, have you ever had to face a real judge? I know some time ago I told you the story of a traffic violation when I did actually have to face a judge. But more recently, I was assessed an additional income tax for something I had no idea that I owed this tax. And I won't bore you with all the details, but I did appeal that tax assessment and went before the appeals board and lost before the appeals board. They upheld this extra assessment on my income tax. Now, we have good lawyers, we have expert tax advisors, and we were certain that the assessment was based on some laws and some clauses and laws that simply didn't apply to me or my situation. And so we were convinced to bring the claim to civil court. And after several years of due process and writing back and forth, I actually appeared before three judges and had to also testify. And um, unfortunately, those judges upheld the assessment. Well, not to be deterred, we were still convinced that the assessment was incorrectly assessed to me, so we appealed to a higher court. And after some more years of process and some more writing back and forth, I appeared before three more judges. And I wish I had a good ending to the story. <laughs> but unfortunately, before these three judges, although we were convinced that we had such a strong case. There was just no way they would upheld the lower, uh, uphold the lower court's decision. My tax assessment held. Because somehow, my particular situation, my particular constellation of things fell under some obscure clause within the taxation laws. I was unaware of it, but even when I was made aware of it, I was still convinced, especially by our tax advisors, that it didn't apply to me. Nevertheless, regardless of how I might see it, the law says it one way, and I am or was assessed this assessment, and it is binding. Now, I can still try to claim I'm, I was completely unaware, um, but guess what? It doesn't change my standing before the law. And if anyone here has ever stood before a judge in a court of law, you know it's not exactly the most comfortable place to be, right? Anyone ever had to stand before a law and be accused of anything? Anyone? You're all innocent completely? Wow, I'm the only one, I guess. Six judges, um, but yes. But for good reason, everyone in a courtroom is reverent. Everyone stands up when the judges enter, and no one sits down until the judges tell you, you may be seated. And I think for good reason, because we all know that if we are found guilty, there is some penalty that we have to pay. If the accusations against us hold true, then the only thing we can do from that point on is either appeal to their mercy or else ask for a pardon or pay for our crime. Now, regarding our moral standing before the Lord God, the just judge, the creator of all things, the eternal judge and ruler of the universe, he reveals to us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous before him. All are guilty of breaking his law. The Israelites are guilty. They have their law, the, the law, they know his commandments, and they will be judged according to them. 
non-Israelites who may not have his commandments can still perceive God's power and his nature and creation and are also guilty and will be judged accordingly. Romans chapter 2 verse 12 says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And on that day of judgment, when all who have ever lived will stand before the Lord, anyone's claims of either ignorance or excuses or explanations or appeals for review or any kind of special treatment will be dismissed. Because God's righteousness will be the standard and all who fall short will justly be condemned. Romans 2.9 says there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, that is the non-Jew. However, there is good news. Good news of the power of God unto salvation, to save the ungodly, to save the unrighteous, to save the wicked and the evildoers, the guilty and the condemned. And this indeed is the good news that we preach in this place that gets spoken from our lips. And last week's verse in Romans 8 verse 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen for that? That is good news indeed, is it not? Do you hear it? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because Christ Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So though I may be guilty of transgressing the law of God, God will not condemn me the death that I deserve. How can a just judge rule that way and still remain just? Because if God does not condemn the guilty, how can we have any assurance that evildoers who have perhaps been evil towards us or defrauded us or wicked people who've committed crimes against humanity, tyrants who are guilty of war crimes, how can we be assured that they ever will face judgment for their actions? Well, today we're going to continue our study through Romans and we will continue to unpack the truths of Romans chapter 8, especially that opening verse. 8 verse 1 that says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And last Sunday, Conrad unpacked Paul's statement and followed, especially the statement that followed such a marvelous statement, which was in verse 2, which says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So today in verses 3 and 4, those two verses will help us unpack verse 2. How exactly did the law of the spirit of life free us from the law of sin and death? What is it that Paul is calling the law of sin and death in the first place? And how is it that we who are in Christ Jesus have been set free from it so that there's no longer any condemnation that we must bear? So if you turn with me to Romans chapter 8, please look with me in verse 3 and 4. As Paul unpacks what he's just said in verse 2, by explaining this, he says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we're going to try to answer three questions today, three very important questions that come that spring from these very important verses. What is it that God's law could not do? Secondly, why am I not condemned for my sins? And finally, how is it then that I am deemed righteous? So what is it that the, God, the law of God could not do? Remember, Paul stated in verse 2, we who are in Christ Jesus have been set free from the law of sin and death. How exactly have we been set free from the law of sin and death? Before we try to answer that question, maybe we should first ask, what is the law of sin and death? What do you think it is? Is it the law of God? Is God's moral law given through Moses the law of sin and death? Well, if you've been following along, you know that Paul would answer, absolutely not. <laughs> 
he would never call the law of God that was given through Moses a law of sin and death. If you go back to chapter 7, you can see him asking, so is what shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means, Romans 7, verse 7. He wants to make sure we, when we try to understand his view of the law of God, that we don't mistake it for being sin itself. And because what happens when I receive the law of God, then sin within me begins to stir a desire to sin, and then that sin leads me to death. Is it then the law's fault that I'm then led to death because God has revealed to me his commandments? Well, by no means, again, Paul wants to make sure we don't misunderstand his view of the law of God. He maintains that the law of God is holy and righteous and good. But he says to us that sin in us produces death in us through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. So the law of God, that is the law that was revealed through Moses, reveals to us God's righteousness. It shouldn't be seen as the law of sin and death. Now, if Paul is not referring to the law of God as this law of sin and death that held us captive, what is it then? The law of sin and death is a power or a, in a, an authority that is over us so that our fleshly body is held captive because we have transgressed against the law of God. And as long as I am under the authority, the power of sin and death, Paul says, I will be unable to do right. I will simply be unable to live righteously. As he explained in chapter 7, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. And I might delight in the law of God, but as he calls another law is in my members. The sin that dwells within me, that continues to wage war against the law of my mind. And it keeps me doing the evil things that I do not want to do. This is the law of sin and death. And that's why as long as I'm under its power or authority, I need someone who will deliver me from this body of death. And as Paul comes to a conclusion in chapter 7, thanks be to God who has delivered me through Christ Jesus. And therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So while the law of God is indeed holy and righteous and good, it is unable to make anyone righteous because anyone who is still under this other law, this another law, the law of sin and death, cannot live up to the standards even if we tried. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord because he is able to deliver us and set us free. Because being in Christ Jesus through faith in his redeeming and his saving work that he did on the cross, we are placed under a new law which Paul describes in verse 1 as the law of the spirit of life, a different power and authority, one that overcomes the power and authority we were under before, that my fleshly body was held captive to. So God has done what the law of God could not do because it was weakened by the flesh. God's law wasn't weak, but it was weakened by the sin that was in my flesh. And God has then, therefore, had to deliver us and free us from that power. So even though you and I might know the Ten Commandments, we might be able to memorize them, you might be able to recite them here, maybe that's a good recitation for someone. And we know that we must love our neighbor as ourself. We know we must avoid unlawful sexual relations. We know we must maintain justice. And even though we may seek to abide all of them, all of us will fall short of God's righteousness because his laws, first of all, they address more than just the outward actions. We know that from Jesus' words that oftentimes it's our motive and our attitudes as well that will be judged by God's law, our heart. And when we're faced with some kind of a restriction in the law of God, as Paul was saying, do not covet, then all of a sudden that restriction makes me want to covet. And so the law of God keeps getting weakened by this sinfulness of myself, because as long as I'm sold under sin, as long as I'm of the flesh, then the sin that dwells within me will constantly be undermining every attempt I make to fulfill God's holy and righteous and good law. So the law of God isn't weak, but it's weakened because all of us who have descended from Adam 
have been subjected to the power of sin. And the law cannot enable us to abide by it and to make us righteousness. And therefore, God did what the law could not do by sending his son, Christ Jesus, our deliverer. So if we want to be free from guilt, and I hope you two don't like to feel guilty, but if you want to be free from guilt, to be released from condemnation, to be assured of life on judgment day, then you must acknowledge that first of all, the law of God is good. It is holy, it is righteous. We must abide by it. It is the righteous character of God that we must conform to. But you must also acknowledge that you are unable to conform to it. You are guilty and worthy of condemnation, and that's called confession, turning away from your sin and asking God to save you. Because on that day, none of us will be able to argue, God, I think you got your, all your laws wrong. God, I don't think that clause really applies to me. No, if I look carefully at these laws and these conditions, that's not me. I'm, I, I'm innocent. We can't claim that we were never made a, uh, aware of such obscure laws applied to our particular behavior. We cannot say we tried our best. The only way to escape condemnation is to be in Christ Jesus. He is the only one who can deliver us from this body of death. He's the only one who can take us from being under the power of sin and death to the power of life in the spirit. Now, is God then still just and right? If you and I were deserving of condemnation and yet we're not condemned. I mean, how would you see it if someone who abused you or took advantage of you were told by God, no, I won't condemn their behavior? Or how would you respond if a judge told the scammer who emptied your bank account, there's no penalty to pay. You don't have to pay it back. How is that fair, right? And there is indeed a lot of wickedness, a lot of evil in the world we see today. Many people never face trial. Some who do face trial get convicted but never have to serve their entire sentence. There are war crimes going on even now. State-sponsored acts of terror, organized crime that undermines justice and fairness is not our greatest assurance that everyone will indeed one day meet their maker and they will indeed pay for their crimes. So how can God, the just judge, not condemn us or others who are in Christ Jesus? Which leads us to that next question with, with why am I not condemned for my sin? Well, Paul answers that question also in these verses three and four, that God sent his own son Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. That God sent his son, Jesus of Nazareth, born to Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. And we need to understand here this very important um, truth that Paul uh, is explaining here when he uses the word flesh. Now, the word for flesh in Greek is sarx. In English, we get the word, for example, sarcoma, a fleshly tumor. Or the word sarcophagus, that coffin that a body gets put in so that the flesh is eaten away and all that's left are bones. And when we translate sarx into English, the most direct translation is flesh. But all of you who are here, I'm sure you, especially a group this diverse, you know what it's like to translate from one language into another, right? That in some languages, words have a variety of meanings and you can't just directly translate it into the other language immediately, right? Let me take an example of Danish and English. Pretty much all of you know what Leilihild means, right? In Danish. Right, it means your apartment. But it also means an occasion or an opportunity. Right, so if you're going to translate from Danish into English, you can't always use the word apartment for Leilihild. Or you'd come up with statements like, you know, um, that I came up with. <laughs> Uh, I'm moving into my opportunity next week. Or, please get back to me at your earliest apartment. You have to know which word to use depending on the use in the original language, right? Well, sarx, the Greek word, can be translated into English as flesh, but it's used in many senses, which may include the fleshly tissue of the body, a personhood. If you remember when Peter confessed 
that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. Jesus said to him that flesh and blood did not reveal that to him, but the Father did. It can refer to physicality. Jesus himself was descended from David according to the flesh. And all Jews are descended from Abraham according to the flesh. So it's your physical aspect. Or sometimes it refers to the human race. As God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Or it can refer to the sinful part of humanity, our sinful nature as it's oftentimes translated, especially when flesh is used in a negative connotation. So many English translations, when it sees the word sarx, it translates it as our sinful nature. And so we need to know what the reference is too, but God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's an emphasis on Jesus's humanity. He was like us, human beings who are sinful, because he was born of Mary. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he took on human flesh. He was here physically. Now remember, it doesn't require that you are sinful to be human. Although it is a reality of every human being since Adam and Eve, don't forget, Adam and Eve had not sinned in the garden until they had sinned. They were still fully human before they sinned. And Jesus, our Savior, came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But Jesus, our Savior, was also the Son of God. And so he was divine. And he was sinless. But he was human in every way that makes us human. And when he says he was sent for sin, or as the NIV translated, to be a sin offering, the emphasis here is on Christ's role as a lamb of sacrifice, the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. So by coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, Jesus could represent you and me, who are part of the human race descended from Adam and Eve. And the reason that there's no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ is because God has already condemned sin by condemning his son to death. And that's what we call the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And that is the reason that there no longer remains any condemnations for the sins that you and I commit if we are now in Christ. Though Christ, uh, Christ was sinless, it says, for our sake, God made him to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was sinless, but God made him to be sin. The flesh and blood of bulls and goats, they couldn't atone for us, because that's the flesh of blood and blood of bulls and goats. But the flesh and blood of God the Son, that can atone for us. And because he was the Son of God, he can represent us all, not just one of us. And so when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, we have to remember that the anguish he endured, the pain, the suffering, and the death that he went through, that was the condemnation and punishment that all of mankind is guilty of. And so when God chooses to pardon the sinner on judgment day, it is not because he is unjust or soft on sin. Look at the suffering of Jesus Christ and you'll see that God is not soft on sin. No, the wickedness and the evil of mankind he bore, and Christ suffered in our place. And God the Father had to forsake his Son. In Jesus' very dying moments, the Father had to forsake his own Son, because God condemned sin in the flesh by condemning his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And yes, one day we will gather around the throne of God and celebrate the fact that on that throne is one who appears as a lamb, a lamb who has atoned for our sins. By his blood, he ransomed a people for God. And in the meantime, while we wait until that day, we can express our gratitude for Christ's great sacrifice Every day that we live and experience the, the lack of condemnation for us that awaits us on Judgment Day can be a day to thank God 
for the son whom he sent. And how then have I been deemed righteous then? The third and last question for today. Well, it says that Christ's righteousness has been applied to us. That what the law of God required of us, his righteous requirements, it says in Romans 8, verse 4, it has been fulfilled in us. Now, it was clear that under the law of sin and death, under the power and authority that sin had over us, we would never be able to do what's required of us. But now that we're in Christ, now that we belong to Christ, we stand perfectly righteous before the Father. In him, of course. Remember how the trespass of Adam led to the condemnation of all men and many were made sinners? In the same way, by the very obedience and perfect obedience of Jesus, Paul said, many will be made righteous. And being made righteous is again a reference to the, reference to the fact that our righteousness is counted to us. Going all the way back to Romans chapter 4, just like Abraham, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So no one will be justified in the sight of God by works of the law. No, the righteousness of God comes to us who believe in Christ Jesus because we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So God is therefore the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And any one of us who has been trying so hard perhaps to live by every one of God's laws as best we can or to break as few of them as we can, that kind of justification comes as a great relief. There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. And that confidence we have, the confidence to be able to stand on that day of judgment, to be among the congregation of the righteous, as Psalm 1 says, is only because of Christ's obedience and not ours. Our righteousness comes as a gift. The testimony of everyone in heaven will be that while the reason that they are in heaven is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. My sanctification, my redemption, my holiness comes through him. And so the lives that we live on earth in faith of Jesus Christ for our salvation, they're lived without that fear of judgment day. They're lived with confidence. Does it mean we now ignore the law of God and what it has to say about righteous behavior? Of course not, because the law of God is still holy and righteous and good. And it is still worth delighting in and meditating on it day and night because it still teaches us the character of God that he is conforming us to. But when we obey the commandments of God, when we do good to our neighbors, it's no longer in order to gain his favor. Now it's because we have gained his favor. When we do good to our neighbor, it's not so that we can have eternal life one day. It is because we already have eternal life today. Because if I was going to be good to my neighbor just so that one day I might receive the favor of God, then I'm just self-serving. Then I'm doing it for myself. But when I know that my salvation has already been paid for, and I know I'm spending eternity in heaven with God, then the things that I do for my neighbor are because of what God has already done for me. And they can be self-sacrificing, just as my Savior did for me. So God is involved in our salvation and redemption. Because notice again when, what he says in verses 3 and 4. Perhaps you didn't notice this the first reading, but the Trinity is in this passage Last Wednesday night, as we were studying the Bible together, I was asking the group, do you see what truths are in here? And the Father was mentioned, the Spirit was mentioned, the Son was mentioned. We kept going back and forth. Now, but what, what is the doctrine that's in here? And we went back and forth, and the word I was looking for was Trinity. You won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but its doctrine is clearly there in so many places, including in Romans chapter 8. Because it's God the Father who sent the Son, Right? It's the Son who accepted and bore the condemnation for our sins, and it's the Holy Spirit that applies that atoning sacrifice to us and releases us from the law of sin and death to enter into that law of the Spirit of life in Christ. The Trinity is all over these verses, even though the word isn't mentioned here. And while our faith for the forgiveness of sins is the finished work of Jesus Christ the Son, it is God the Father to whom we've been reconciled, and it is now the new way of the Spirit in which we live and serve God instead of the old way of the written code. And so the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, 
are involved in saving us and releasing us from the power of sin and death. And now we're also going to be exploring a lot more in the, day, in the weeks to come about walking according to the Spirit. The Spirit who will always lead us into a way of life and a speech and a conduct and a behavior that reflects Christ's character. We'll be exploring that because what's coming up next is those who live according to the flesh. Again, we'll be exploring that concept versus walking according to the Spirit. So it's important, again, that we understand how Paul uses the word sarks or flesh in the next several verses. But let me come to a conclusion here. What is it that the law of God could not do? Well, it could not make us righteous. As all of our attempts to abide by the law were always subverted by the presence of sin and evil around us. So why am I not condemned for my sin? Because my sin was already condemned when my sin was born by Christ and he was condemned. And how am I then deemed righteous? By faith in Christ, that God has counted to me Christ's righteousness so that the life I live today is by the power of his spirit within me. God condemned sin when he condemned his son to death so that I might be filled with the spirit of life. As I said in the beginning, very few feelings are worse than the awareness of our own guilt. And the best way to deal with our guilt is to either seek a pardon or to make necessary amends. We cannot make amends. We must seek God's pardon. Or else our guilt will continue to bother our conscience. But in your guilt before God, in my guilt before God, for sins that we've confessed in the past, let us approach God's throne, confess our sins, seek his mercy, receive his forgiveness, and believe that Christ has already been condemned. Then we can live in freedom from that condemnation by the power of the Spirit within us. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as we bow before you, we acknowledge your holiness. If we were to stand before you, clothed in our own sin, we would be terrified. But Lord, those of us who come in the name of Jesus Christ and by faith in him, we come clothed with his righteousness, made holy and pure. And for that, Lord God, we are so thankful that we can come before you and cry out, Abba, Father, to know you intimately as you know us. And so I thank you, Lord, for this community that's here today that also trusts in Jesus Christ for their salvation. But Lord, I know that among us, there could also be those who've never received the forgiveness that comes in Christ. And I pray, O oh Lord, that the words spoken from your truth today, your word, might ring true in their own hearts, that they would see their own sin and their own frustration with trying to live according to your law. And we pray, Lord, that they too would call upon the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And for us, Lord, in our daily lives, help us to every day be so thankful and grateful that we do not any longer live under condemnation, but have been set free. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.